The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. Way to get a 225. <laughs> Baby Jesus. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I got Rowdy Roddy Piper, uh, a guy that I have the utmost respect for, as I've already told you guys before I brought this cat into the studio. <laughs> I told Roddy the protocol of the show and how I was going to lay it down. I said, it's not going to be like I'm introducing you like you're hitting the ring. So I went ahead and threw that at him, and he damn near spit his diet coke all over the table. Roddy, uh, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Uh, woof. I'm riding fast, but I, I'm honored to be here. Uh, you know, Steve, it's funny in, uh, in our business, you know, I've seen you in the locker room and uh, seen you obviously on TV do some great stuff. But um, there was a gentleman who wanted me to do a show called The Voice. And so the, I think his name was Michael. And he Michael said, Chevello. Okay, so he sent me your uh, episode that you did on The Voice, and I watched it. And I, I mean this and all, like, I didn't know anything about you. So uh, as much as we, could, we say hello, we really don't know a lot about each other. No, we, we never have crossed too many nah. territories. We, we've never crossed territories together. Never. And, and you, you know, came down the road maybe, you know, 10 years before I did. A little bit. There's, yeah. that, there's that age gap. But yeah. we never really crossed paths as much uh, in high regard as I held you. Thank to, you. To, to your point, we don't know each other. And no. so it was funny because you sent me a text out of the blue. I watched that voice and started hearing how you came up through the business and how you paid your dues. And I, I feel bad about this now. I just never thought of you that way. And when I saw that, it's like, well, that's my brother. And that's why I just got out the text and said, great job. And that's how it started. I just, you know, sometimes you, we get buried in our own stuff and we... I do. Speak for myself. Well, who's we? You got a mouse in your pocket? <laughs> no, but it's funny it's uh, because you're, uh, and I don't mean this in uh, an antique fashion, but you're so old school. I mean, yeah, you you paid your dues. You earned your stripes. I mean, you paid double dues. So from your mentality, and, and it's, it's kind of like me. When I look back, hey, man, yes, guy, he didn't even really like the business. He just got in to make money. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're of that pure mindset that you, you love the business yes. and, and you pay your dues to yeah. work your way up and, and you gain the knowledge from the bottom as Oof. you get the uh, crap stomped out of you along the way. You get Those smart. Long the drives way. with Sweet Hansen. Yeah, talking the business. Oh, they... Your brain is a sponge. Everybody pours water yep. into the sponge and you sit there and you ask questions. Yep. Now, you really offer nothing. If you're not asking a question, you don't really have any business talking because That's you true. have no experience with which to speak of. <laughs> correct? That's correct. And I'm. they would let you know immediately. <laughs> oh, yeah. I used to ride down the road with Dutch. Dutch Mantel kind of uh, took uh, me under his wing. I was traveling together i didn't have any money to pay for any gas so it was yeah. me and him and chris champion they put the gas in my high under excel and dutch was always ragging on me and it's back when i chewed red man tobacco and he'd take all my tobacco and chew it and then leave an empty bag there and finally he had you know he was giving me knowledge but yeah. he's also you know busting my chops yeah hammering. so finally i'd always go let me tell you something dutch and he goes there's nothing you can tell me <laughs> and he was right so i just <laughs> shut up kept taking his advice yeah. and learning I remember. I don't know if you can remember this. I can remember when Trans was one cent a mile. You yeah. Used to have to pay the driver one cent a mile. Then uh, Trans went up to two cents a mile. Is that how y'all did it back in the day? Yeah, yeah. like the mid guys, the mid card guys. They would uh, their wives would make sandwiches and stuff. Yeah. And they, yeah, man. <laughs> and you'd be on the corner. If you weren't on the corner, you missed. And they would get three guys in the car. And in the beginning, like, they would count the mileage, and at the end of the trip, everybody gave, a, in this case, a penny a mile or two cents a mile. You could buy the sandwiches, like, for 50 cents. That was an old Bronco Lubitsch story. One, ah, one, I yeah, love it. Yeah, yeah, one time back in the day, you know, one of the guys made a bunch of sandwiches for everybody, and a lot of guys just thought he made a bunch of sandwiches to hand out because he was a good guy. <laughs> no, the, no. Hell no. <laughs> At the end of the trip, he goes, okay, so-and-so, yeah, that was two yeah. sandwiches for you, and then the trans, and, you know, you collect yeah. your money because it's business. You know, when you're scrapping and you're trying to come up in a business, you ain't making a damn thing. Nothing. It's kind of hard to get down the road. It was a funny story because uh, uh, I watched a clip of you recently. WWE just uh, announced WWE Network, 
and they showed some highlights from Legends House, the reality uh, oh, program that really? you had a part of. <laughs> and you and I were talking the other day, and you oh. were like, all, all your years on the road, uh, you like to stay by yourself. Now, yeah. coming up, you, you certainly healed a few rooms and, and packed guys in, in a room like sardines to save money because you had to, but by yeah. and large, you're a loner. You like to do your own thing. Yes, sir. So all of a sudden, you were forced into a room Whoa, with, with uh, Duggan. Uh, I saw Jim Duggan. Uh, uh, you know, I first four dead nights, I wouldn't go in the room. So uh, where were you sleeping? On the floor in uh, what they would call the living room. It was Harpo Mark's Mansion and uh, Palm Beach. Oh, that's cool. West Palm Beach. Yeah, yeah. kind of. You know, yeah, it was yeah. done upright. They they didn't hold no expense back, but I uh, I just always had a hard time go, uh, falling asleep like that. Uh, but eventually, you know, Hacksaw. <laughs> I don't know how much. Like, I didn't know Hacksaw that well at that time either. Yeah, but, I don't know him at all. I said, okay, so yeah. things like this. I go, you know, you're getting up, and I'm trying to take care of my roommate, right? And I says, Hacksaw, did you order your food? He goes, no, I asked it nicely. <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? And somebody's talking about salt in their food and, and so, no Sodom and Gomorrah, and they turn to a pillar of salt, and Hacksaw looks and goes, Salt's bad for you. <laughs> you know, <I> non stop, <laughs> right? Yeah. He just, uh, he was a wonderful guy. What did you guys gel as uh, roommates? Uh, well, roommates? I guess we're going to yeah. see. Yeah, we'll I guess see. you want to let the cat on, out of the bag. Nah, no, but um, I was definitely the dark horse in, that, in the whole uh, episodes of it. I, uh, I have a hard time being uh, harnessed. You know, if I feel like someone's bullying me or harnessing me, I have a hard well, time. But you sound to me like you just need your space. I mean, like, man, yeah. I, I love people. But yeah. most people that are close to me know that I'm a hermit. When I go to South Texas, it's just me and my wife, or if I'm just down there by myself. Uh, I love seeing human beings, but by the same token, if I go down to my place and I don't see one for one or two months, I'm totally fine with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like, I've always been, you know, it's hard to believe, but um, I'm extremely shy uh, to a fault. Come on, man. Nah, I know. Straight I know. up? Straight up. I'm not, you know, like, all the stories and stuff that uh, Flair tells or whatever, those were done in very wild days with a lot of consumption. Right. But as a human being from the beginning, I, I left home when I was 13, and I... Uh, hey, man, you got suspended hid. from junior high, right? Or, or, or kicked out of junior yeah, high. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and so you I had a, a beef knife. with your father? Oh, you pulled a knife on somebody. I was wondering I'm what the happened. I'm vice principal. I'll tell you the story. Yeah, I don't... please do. I mean, not a good thing to do if you're no. junior high. <laughs> 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 These days you can't even carry a pocket knife to school. True. No, but but True. but tell me about that story because because we're talking mm. about paying dues, and I know. Yeah. And, and here's the thing that uh, it was funny when you sent me that text message because I held you in such high regard, but in doing my research about you, there were so many things about yourself that I did not know. Yeah. And man, if you got on the road at 13 years of age, and I know when you had your first pro match, and we'll, we'll get 50. to that, but uh, you paid not just dues in in the business of pro wrestling, but life dues. You know, getting out uh -huh. and having to sport. Yourself by yourself. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, so what happened with the knife? Well, I'm trying to tell you this, and I just, I can just tell you the truth is all. It was in Toronto, and I was trying to go to school, and it's a junior high school, and still in Canada, I I don't know why. Um, so like it's gym class, and they've got a big swimming pool, and they insist. You swim naked. They insist. The YMCA's at that back of the day insisted. And, like, I was, like, I was having a hard time with it. Well, and the uh, coach, uh, like, I had started to amateur wrestle a little bit, you know, whatever. Uh, and uh, the coach was really getting on my case. And uh, I said a few words, and all of a sudden the vice principal, and, like, they were cornering me wow. in the locker room. Like, I didn't understand, and mm. I had the... Um, I had a knife, and I just, I got confused. I just was really scared. Right. And right. I'm there, all of a sudden I had it, and then, you know, things got real ugly then. And uh, oh, I got uh, kicked out of that school there. Um, it, I wasn't, like, you hear all these, I've never tried to hurt anybody. 
I, I really haven't. I don't, no, and I'm I get a bag that. Pipe, I mean, dude, I'm a bagpipe player. Well, right, but you got two guys got you in a corner in self-defense. Oh, cow, and I didn't understand. What's the point? Right. What? Why? I get it. And uh, well, you know, living on the yeah, living on the street just just like uh, that's a hard piece of business there. So uh, I, yeah, I didn't do well in school. I. Um, I've got about a grade eight education. Now, I scammed my way. <laughs> Don't get me wrong now. I, there was a high school I went to, and I broke into it at night, stole the test. This is a true story. Uh, what was the name of it? Windsor Park. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got to pass this thing. So I broke a window at nighttime, and I ran through the school at nighttime, went to the, where I knew the tests were, grabbed the test, and ran out and hid in a snowbank. And sure as heck. Here come the police because there's silent alarms. Right. But I'm in a snowbank, right? I was born in Saskatoon. I'm a snowboy. So I take the test home, and, like, I fill out the test, and I'm so proud of myself. And I come in the next day for the test, and it's all handed out. Everybody's taking it. And I have the test, like, under my, uh, <laughs> under my shirt and my tummy, you know? And, you know, I'm really cocky. But ADD kicks in and boredom, and so pff, I switch him and... I was done first. Unusual. However, I was so proud, and I put the test there and waved goodbye to my uh, fellow fellow students, and I came back the next day, and they handed out the tests, and it said, <laughs> the teacher said, sorry, Rod, wrong test. <laughs> I stole the wrong test. <laughs> <laughs> really, baby Jesus? <laughs> Give me a break. Sorry, Rod. Get, wrong, wrong test. test. Truth. Classic. Truth. And uh, <laughs> I could have done a year in the pen for that. <laughs> well, did, you, did you ever end up graduating high school? They pretend I did. Right. Uh, I tried to go to school when I was wrestling pro. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, like I went back and I got the key to the city in Winnipeg is where I had my first pro match. But, and I went to visit the school, and they pulled these cards out like you got 50%. Yeah. And, but, you know, this is, if I may, I don't want to bore you. No, you know? I, I t I'll tell you something that I never really talked about. Whew. I was born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is one of the coldest places on earth. Yep. No, like 100 below with the wind chill. Um, when I was four years old, I got my arm caught in a washing machine wringer. And... Uh, I couldn't get out. You used to wear, you used to put clothes uh, in the washing machine. It would like squeeze them to get it out. And uh, the washing machine was plugged in. They had undo the light, uh, the people that were raising me, and the ceiling. And the plug was in there. And I guess from flailing, you know, I hit the plug and, and hit the uh, emergency thing. Yeah. Like two rollers on top exactly. of each other. You yeah, know what feet, I'm talking yeah, about. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, so my arm right up to here. Mm. And I lived, I was born on 1802 Victoria Avenue. And my aunt was 1602 Victoria Avenue. So I ran down the alley, and I, I, would, I rocked a lot as a kid. And I never said anything. And uh, I was just sitting on the chair. And, you know, it's Canada. The liquor store is closed at a certain time. So Uncle George, you know, I'm busy. You know, okay. And then blood started to come down. And they put me in the hospital. And um, when I got out, they took me right away away from Saskatoon and put me on an Indian reservation called The Paw, T-H-E-P-A-S. And it's still to this day uh, the toughest Indian reservation in, in Canada. It's the home of the World's Trappers Festival. They used to do a program, Wide World of Sports, once a year where they're real trappers. They're not, you right. know, you don't pet the dogs. The dogs right. are chained down. Uh, and, like, they had contests of the cutting the logs and who could carry the most uh, pounds of flour, which this local Indian guy carried like 500 pounds or something. And, right. I mean, just get this. You know, I'm going to tell you. I've always wanted to, and I'm going to tell you now. Hold a cow, and then I'll quit if you're still talking to me. So I was the only white kid in this Indian reservation. I was so scared. I, I can't tell you how scared I was. And... My first grade, um, I, I, just, I begged not to go. And to the point where, and I'm not exaggerating anything, I held on to the man's ankle, and the man mm -hmm. literally 
moved his foot like a walking dead all the way and cried. Everybody in the hallway watching me, and the teacher's name was Miss Hill. She says, I take care of the little boy. And uh, they left me, and she took out, in Canada it was legal, it had a handle and this uh, triple leather. And, she, you know, she got me, stop yeah. crying there. Yeah. Bring, yeah. bring, you betcha, shutting up. And uh, when they taught me, they taught, they had a new way of teaching. Do you have a pen uh, anything fancy? Oh, maybe we could get one as I was going along. This is along Steve here. Austin show pen for me. <laughs> I love I it. I got a pocket knife. <laughs> <laughs> we'll carve it in here. They, in, so in my very first year in school, uh, the country decided that they're going to change the way to teach children. So with reading, you see, I, I've never read a book cover to cover, not even the one I I've wrote. I've heard you say that in interviews. Straight up shoot, you've never read a book. No, sir. Cover to cover, I right. can't. A right. script, I have to have someone read it with me. Right. I don't get it. And here's where it came from, was instead of teaching you phonics, they taught memorization. Right. And so... Why would and, they do that? Because the government thought it was a better way to teach kids and instituted it through the country. Then they had a thing called new math, and I'm writing it down for Steve now, and it's division. We'll put 10 into 1,000. Right. What you did is, well, you look at the 10, and on the side, there's a long line. And you go, well, I know 10 goes into 1,000 one time. You subtract it. That would leave 990. Well, it'll go in two times. That's 20. You subtract it. That's 970. And you kept that up, and then you added these numbers and put it up there. Man, that's some long ass arithmetic. Holy cow. Now, while I was in this Indian reservation, I mean, they hated me. And I wore muckalock. Why, just because you're a white kid? Yeah. 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 I mean, it, I wasn't, it wasn't a personality trait. It was just you was the... Yes, was, sir. The, 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 I was really scared right. and, you know, an easy target. And in recess, you know, uh, I was kind of like the, the foil. But here's what happened. Um, I couldn't go home the way the other kids went. And like in January, February, March, this place is, you can only get around by Caterpillar. I, I beg you people to look it up. The Paw Manitoba, T-H-E-P-S. And I used to have to go by the tree line. And they had these things called timber wolves. And I don't know yeah. if you've seen the timber wolf. The big ass wolf. Oh, baby yeah. Jesus. No kidding. Yeah. You know, they are a pack by themselves. And they would snatch a kid like, January, February, March, where game was scarce. If they came on a kid, they would snatch the kid. Right. So they taught me. I would have to go by, like, the tree line so it wouldn't get beat up. And I sang a song. I'm embarrassed, man. Okay, hang on. If you're going to tell it, Rod, tell the damn thing. What song were you singing? Uh, John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. The reason I sang it was if you, if you accidentally came in contact with one of these wolves, they'd turn on you. If one of these wolves heard a human voice, more than likely they get away from it because they get shot or whatever. Right. But if you were if you you were quiet and they turned and they saw a little right. piece of game there, Can boom, they you got jump you. your ass. So I'm gonna tell you this now. Holy cow. Oh so there the highway was right we had a little red shack. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, we had a little red shack, literally, by the railway tracks. And it, it was a company shack. And it had a kitchen, uh, two bedrooms, uh, a lot of rats down in it. And uh, it was right next to the railway tracks. And across the street was the only person who would speak to me. Her name was Arlene Philly. And her dad owned the general store. I'm across the street, and one of my sisters goes to go to school, and I ran across to hug her, and I got hit by a truck. Maybe go, I don't know, 25, 30 miles an hour. I can remember when it hit me, I, I went up and I landed on the pavement, but the, the force had me rolling to the ditch, but I can remember my eyes backwards and seeing the tire. And the guy in the truck was an Indian gentleman, been drinking, but back in those right. days, like, uh, uh, no, he's getting up, yeah, yeah okay, goodbye, goodbye. Yeah. And they never took me to the hospital. So Any damage? Don't know. Yeah. Um, so then, 
During the winter, and I, I'll get out of this in a second, but you need to know. During the winter time, I have really bad tummy problems, and the only way you can get to the hospital is a Catholic hospital is by um, greater uh, caterpillar. Caterpillar, thank you, sir. And to get the caterpillar and bring a kid in, you, all right. So they get me in, and I got appendicitis. They take out my appendix. Nothing's wrong with them. I had tonsillitis, so they took out the tonsils. Uh. And then they give me a shot when I cried. Or some, I was by myself there. And so, okay, move on. And in the springtime, um, there's so much snow, and it's a logging industry. There's logs in big puddles of snow. And for some reason, Rod liked to roll on the logs, right. you know, and boom, in the, in the water, Rod would go. And uh, I got scared to go home because uh, I wasn't supposed to do that. And so I'm with, uh, um, I'm with my friend, and sh her and I rolling on the logs, and we both went down, okay? Oh, and I'm too scared to go home. And right across the street is her father's store and next to it kind of like a garage with a pot-bellied stove in it. Arlene and I went across the street and we took all our clothes off. I'm six years old. All our clothes off to hang them to get them to dry. Right. But, you know, we're naked in, in, the, in the garage. And Arlene, uh, uh, um, Arlene's mummy was a very religious woman. And, like, I can only pick up certain points for you here, but I remember her coming in and she screamed rape. Oh, and geez. she called the police. Yeah. And in those days, there was only one policeman for like, he was an RCMP for like 300 miles in every direction. Right. And uh, so she called that policeman and he came. And that policeman was my dad. Wow. Um, that's how I started my first year. And then, boom, they moved me out of there to another place. And by the time I got like grade three or four, I was so lost. I, you know, uh, I, I couldn't catch on, so I just cheated a lot. <laughs> you know, I got really good at it, but I never absorbed the knowledge. I can't read a book. I, uh, that's what it is, man. Well, yeah, but obviously you're, you're a smart cat. Uh, everybody knows that. I mean, I, I sit there and watch some of your promos, just the, the way you could convey a message uh, to an audience. I mean, it was true emotion and content as well. Sometimes I think people get too mo too lost in, in content. Or, or it's, it's with which, you, you know, bare bones information that comes from the heart and soul. That's yeah. what you evoked. And sometimes you spewed that in a very rabid fashion. But <laughs> hang, hang on for just a second there, Roddy. I got to take care of a little piece of business. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Hey, man, I'm super excited to share with you a product that is an absolute game changer. It's a tobacco and nicotine-free dip alternative with CBD that tastes great and is really enjoyable. Canadip CBD has mastered a discreet and fast-acting way to consume CBD and has provided it in a format that can help you evolve your dip. Canadip CBD is offering my listeners an exclusive offer. They are so confident you will love the product. They are offering the California Roll, which is five tens. One of each of their core flavors, wintergreen, mint, mango, citrus, and spice, for 50% off. That's right, 50% off. For only $25, try all five flavors and find your favorite. Head to CanadipsCBD.com and use promo code STONECOLDCALI for 50% off the California roll. Yep, that's only $5 a 10. These Canadips CBD pouches are all natural, spitless, and are great to use wherever and whenever. No more hiding your tent from your wife and playing sneak at you. Grab the Canadips California Roll at CanadipsCBD.com with promo code Stone Cold Cali and sample the whole lineup. These dip manufacturers from Humboldt County, California, have been perfecting this product since 2016 and are excited for you to try it. Put down your old can and pick up a can of Canadips at CanadipsCBD.com with promo code Stone Cold Cali. And find your favorite flavor in the California Roll for 50% off at only $5 a can. Hey, it fits right in your back pocket and sounds perfect for working around your house. All right, here we are continuing my conversation with Rowdy Roddy Piper, the one and only Hot Rod. Roddy, 
when did you become interested in the game of professional wrestling? Were you uh, watching it on TV? Did y'all have a TV? No, sir. So how um, did you discover it? I, um, I came fifth in the world playing the bagpipes when I was 14 years old. And um, which like was a really bad experience in my life. Um, and I got picked out of 200 pipers in the world to do the Rose Bowl parade. Uh, I don't know, I was 10, 10, 11. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so um, I decided to give it a go on my own. And the way I, they have youth hostels in Canada. And you, they, at that day, they cost a quarter. So you go to the youth hostel, and it opened like at 6 and lights out at 9. And when you come, I swear to you, there was a sign. It says, check your weapons and drugs at the door. Right. And they would take them, and they would give them back to you. And in this thing, it was three-tiered bunk beds. So when you got there for a quarter, you, uh, they would give you uh, a sandwich, uh, a cookie, and a little carton of milk. Boom. You had to, there was some foosball. You had to be used to sleep at 9. 6 o'clock in the morning, rock and roll. They give you two eggs, bacon, piece of toast, milk, a towel, shower, get out, and you can't come back the next day. Right. But you can come back the day after. Right. So I would, um, whew, at nighttime, I would play my bagpipes with the case open. Now, this youth hostels were in a YMCA. So I'm in this YMCA, you know, and, well, I don't rob anybody till nighttime. What am I going to do during the day? <laughs> yeah. And there's a gym, and there was this guy. He was an amateur wrestler and boxer. And he took a liking to me. He was a, a minister. Yeah. And he got me amateur wrestling and boxing, and I, I won the 167 Amateur Wrestling Championship. Da 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 da. And, uh, when, when Vern Gagne would come to Winnipeg, my, my amateur wrestling coach, boxing coach, would be the referee just for that night, a local, right? Right. So I don't know who, I think it may have been Buddy Wolf, but somebody missed a play and didn't show, and my coach comes to me and he says, I can get you 25 bucks. Wow, that's go down money. And, oh, baby, yeah. at a quarter a night, yeah. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, but he said you're going to lose your amateur status. Oh, uh, you know. Wow. Yeah, but it's twenty five bucks. Twenty five bucks, baby. Time to turn pro. <laughs> Time to turn pro. So I. Now this I is at fourteen, right? Fifteen. Now. Fifteen. Okay. Um. So I've never seen a pro match, and Jesus Christ. I went to my pipe band, and said, like, they said, all enthusiastic, we'll play in. Okay. So I got to the Winnipeg Arena, and my opponent was Mr. Perfect's dad, Larry I, the Axe Henning. I heard this. Now, I'm going to stop. Okay. Larry the Axe Henning, to anybody that listens to the show, has never heard of Larry oh. the Axe Henning. This was a big, burly, 300-pound <laughs> crowbar mm. of a man. Whoa. I'm just tough. Hold me there, and let me tell you a Henning story okay. quick. You know that eye poke that I've done so long? I was going to bring that up. you got the greatest double eye okay. poke. I mean, if, if Three Stooges maybe, yeah. but you're the best ever. I love you. This is how, where I got that from. There was a guy, uh, two of the boys. One's name was Horst Hoffman, uh, and the other guy's name was Billy Robinson. Oh. And they hey, Billy Robinson? Yep. Okay. Yeah, and uh, they all talked about Wiggins, which was a place over in England that's just supposed to be great hookers come from there. and. Uh, are great. <laughs> great, great hookers being yeah, talking about yeah. some real wrestlers. Yes, real wrestlers. That can hurt you. <laughs> Not hookers that you pay money to for services rendered. No, that came much yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, didn't, at, I didn't charge much either. Yeah, we're at the first <laughs> set of hookers. <laughs> so, Larry Henning's a family man. And yeah. Horst Hoffman and Billy Robinson and Jeff Ports, they're talking about a, some girls they had the night before that were very, very underage, very inappropriate. And they're, you know, they're these big shooters. And Larry Henning says, you know, you can stop that kind of talk now in the dressing room. I have a family. Mm. And, you know, these guys are these guys are tough guys. And Horst Hoffman comes up to Larry Henning, and Larry Henning stands up like he's going to do something. Uh, like Horst is going to do something. I swear to you. Larry Henning took his two fingers, went pow, in his eyes. End of the day. Are you kidding no, me? Sir. A double eye poke shoot? Pop. Right, and that horse... What horse do? Nothing. Nothing. His eyes were so close. This is Larry Henning. Right, I Driving get him in. And his eyes just closed. He couldn't see... Sh Larry just sat down. 
What did Billy do? Not a damn thing. <laughs> exactly. Billy Robinson's a coward. He only beats you up if he know you can. Really? Yes, sir. Not that he's not good at what he does. Right, right, right. I'm not saying that, but uh, like there was a guy named jo- uh, George Gordianko that trained me. Billy Robinson didn't want nothing to do right. with it, nor did Carl Gotch. Uh, they pretend, respected each other. But Bill, but going back to uh, Larry the Action, big yeah. dude, tough dude, family guy. Thank you, family well, guy. You're going to have your first match with Thank Larry you. the Action. I, I can't say, you, you couldn't be in a more intimidating, intimidated <sighs> position oh. because of who this guy was. So and, what happened? How did you guys have a short conversation before the match? And then, of course, Larry, no. I can't imagine there's a whole lot of communication in the ring. Bing, bang, boom. Let's go home. Holy cow. This is, what happened? Well, okay, now. The, the, the four bagpipers are dressed to the hill. Right. There's a bass drummer with a big fluffy hat. He's got a pint of scotch and a boom, boom, boom. And two snare drummers. Yeah. And me, 167 pounds, <laughs> wearing the kilt from yeah. the band. Yeah. Okay. And this is all I know that Larry Henning said through the promoter, El Tomko. This is what I got. Just be like a greyhound bus and leave the driving to us. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Excuse me? Clarity here? Yeah. So, my pipe band started, and as they were playing me out, my, my first name is Roderick. Short for Roderick is Roddy. That's what the announcer knew. And he had to say something. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, here comes Roddy the Piper. Right. And Larry spoke face was red, there was smoke coming in his eyes, and yeah, like, because there was no music, it was sawdust. Oh, so basically he thought you were insulting him. I it was, was trying production. to, yes, sir. You was upstaging the man. Exactly. On your first endeavor. So you know it. You're greener than grass. I, How dare yeah, you? My first match. Right, unbelievable. Who, who are you? The What's showmanship. This? What's this? The production. And the boom, and that. And Larry's in the ring. Oh, my. Oh, bad move, Rod. <laughs> And all of that I really remember is kind of like, ding, ding. <laughs> Start, <laughs> finish. It was short, a short bus ride. Short. <laughs> it was a short bus ride, sir. Captain, shortest match in the history of the Winnipeg Arena lasted 10 seconds, including the three count. Right. And he, uh, he broke my nose and split my eye open. And I got back to the dressing room. I had my head down, you know. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't very... Uh, I used to think I was tough. <laughs> Not anymore. And there was Mad Dog was in the locker room. and I just, Sean? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I uh, just put my head down. And they used to have these shoes called penny loafers. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. Like, I don't, they put pennies in them. I could see the promoter. I could just see the penny loafers because my sight was yeah. rather... Uh, Your ass won't shut. Yeah. And I thought he was going to duke me out of my 25 bucks. And he said, kid, you did great. How'd you like to go to Kansas City? Come on. And they had, <laughs> no, sir, they well, had, uh, <laughs> You did great. You lasted said, 10 seconds with the axe. You did great. <laughs> yeah. And they put me in a van that night. And they, when it come to the border of the United States, they put the, the mats uh, from the van over me. And I just sleep. Just ask my kid sleeping. Right. And... I never stopped. And for the first four years, they beat me up every night. But the first four years, I didn't have a number. I didn't, so I was expendable. So I was a very handy tool to have. Right. Well, That's hey, all of a sudden, you go into your first match. You know, you, you lose your amateur status. You're a pro. Kid, you did good. We're going to Kansas City. So how long does this decision-making uh, process last? Because all you got is you. So you just pack up and go? What? I, yeah, because I didn't have anything, like, at the youth hostel, there's no closet. Right. You know, and... And it's every other day. And... It ain't like you got a whole bunch I of junk here. I got 25 bucks, right. and I got a ride. I, you know, I think it's more out of fear. I, right. I was scared to say no. Hey, t- well, talk to me about on-the-job training then, because then technically, no one ever really taught you pro wrestling. You no. learned in the ring. Yeah, so I then how the did job. the progression go, and, and what kind of cats were you working with? Obviously, you were most likely working babyface, yes. working with big ass, you know, heels that could Do lead job. you through a match if that's what it is, or beat you. Just, yeah. yeah, yeah. But but you learn you learn the basics, uh, the very basics of psychology by taking an ass whooping from a vicious heel. Yeah, right. They, yeah. They, How long the before time. they let you get some offense in? Oh, four years. 
Really? Yeah, like the, my second match was against Superstar Billy Graham on Fern's television. Uh, he How might, does Superstar take care of you? You know what? I tell you. Uh, he might have be- bested Larry. <laughs> he might have got it done in nine seconds. <laughs> but when I, when I came down, the, it was, uh, it was oh, you went down in these steps in this kind of grimy little place, and uh, Superstar was coming from behind me. And uh, he looks at me and he goes, you know, uh, we were a little short on time or I would have given you more. I looked at him like BS. Right. And he cracked up laughing. Right, right. And he loved me from that. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, I like, really? So, uh, yeah, but, well, you'd been around by then. Who was the first guy to really kind of uh, take you under his wing and shine you up gotcha. and make you look like somebody? I'll tell you what. You know, seriously, for four years, every day at 8 o'clock in the night, they took pleasure in stretching me. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, for like four years. And uh, But, you know, and, and again... You and me are from a, a generation removed from each other, but that's yeah. just the way I hear it was. That, and you're here to say that's the way it was. Yes, sir. I'll give you, uh, we'll get into how I got I got a genius as a mentor. But just before that, they would do things like this. Um, we were driving from Winnipeg. We had to drive all night to do Minneapolis TV. Yeah. Uh, the guy's name was Dave Muir and Bobby Jones were the old timers. I was in the back seat. And they wouldn't put the heat on. They said they were too hot. And I had a bologna sandwich and a bottle of 7-Up for to eat. And finally, the bottle of 7-Up exploded, frozen exploded. Jesus. Um, also, there was a time when, like, license plates were odd and even. You could only get gas on those yeah. times. And so they, they had a six-foot credit card for me. And they stopped by, like, because every farm had this pink gas that was cheaper. And I'd yep. have to siphon the gas and bring it to the cars. And every damn farm seemed to have a German shepherd, and I didn't speak no German. <laughs> now, but I'd rather get bit by the dog than what's yeah. going to happen to me. And then, like, in Dallas, just to kind of give you an idea, my job in Dallas, uh, I stayed at, I'm the only guy, I think, to get kicked out of the Alamo Plaza Hotel in, in Dallas. They don't clean the rug. They just put another layer on. And uh, What would you get kicked out for? Uh, my, my, my dog ate the owner's poodle. <laughs> my <laughs> dog's would... name was Kay Fabin. He was a pit bull. Uh, I never fought yeah. him. But, and, uh, Kay Fabin. He ate his poodle? <laughs> Kay Fabin. Damn, they are Kay Fabin. <laughs> so, and he used to sleep. I had a, um, a Vega hatchback. I used to sleep in. I kept the uh, cooler open so he could get water and what stuff. What year was a Vega? 72, 73? Yeah, yeah, in there someplace. Can't remember, but in Dallas, my job was, Fritz came to me, my job was to get get wrestled, change, and get the fire marshal's daughter and take her out and make sure that she enjoyed wrestling. That way, Fritz could get more people than the fire cold allowed. Right. Like, those kind of jobs never ended. Right. So without getting into that and kind yeah. of moving on, so I, I maybe worked 12 territories, and I got sent to L.A. But while you were there, before you got to L.A., yeah. I mean, you, you, you have fire. As a baby face, you have fire. Some baby face ain't got fire. As yeah. a heel, you had a mean streak. I mean, yes, and, and I believe you have to have two, two key things that I think uh, a person needs to succeed in the business of pro wrestling is fire as a baby face. Mean streak is a heel. You just got yes, to. Yeah. You had to have fought for some of the stuff you were getting there to, to start that fire. I mean, you're a fiery individual yeah. anyway. You have a, chi- a seemingly a chip on the shoulder, uh, always trying to, to, to kick and scratch your way for everything because nothing was handed to you. But you were having to fight for what you were getting in that ring because I know you, you yeah. had to shine some. Yeah. I, and I, you I, had to fight for that against it, veterans. It, it came after a while that – I just fight as hard as I could because, uh, you know, there you go. at least try. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you, oh, this is a family friendly one. Um, yes, there's a lot of stories that happened to me, but um, when I finally got to the Olympic Auditorium, there was this guy named Leo Garibaldi. Mm-hmm. Now, for anybody that's interested that wants to become a pro wrestler, I used to go to UCLA, Mel Hall. And you can watch Gorgeous George, Warren Bockwinkel, Leo Garibaldi when he was 16, his dad. Uh, the whole thing, reel to reel, frame by frame. I used to study them. And uh, so now Gil Garibaldi's the booker. Right. So <laughs> the, what they did in those days was like I would spend uh, six weeks in Texas and Amarillo for funk, doing, jo- uh, you know, doing jobs. Six weeks in Dallas 
doing jobs, six weeks in KC doing jobs. So the faces were new, right. and then they just shipped me off to L.A. to do that. What kind of coin were you making doing that little rotation there? Um, I was getting like 10, 15 bucks a match. Uh, they had one promoter. He put a world of quarters in your hand, and they finally had to smarten me up. Like Then he put another dollar, and when you smiled, he stopped. Uh, you know, and so <laughs> okay. I, uh, and I can, yeah, there's so much. So, so we're back in L.A. now. Okay, thank you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Vince says. You know, you put blinders on Piper, he's fine. But <laughs> I love you. So, um. One tackle, drop down, get it again. Get it again, brother. Keep it simple. I have big problems with that. Uh, but I'm trying. So, Leo Garibaldi sees this, I don't know, I'm maybe going to. A buck seventy-five now. A buck so you've 80. gained a little weight. I have yeah. gained some weight, you know, and bagpipes, baby face. Yep, yep. So the Olympic Auditorium in L.A. is predominantly Hispanics. Right. All that carry knives for yeah. pairing, I'm sure. <laughs> so I come in, and he looks at me, like, and he just pauses. And, and what's going through his head is, I got a skinny white kid. Playing the bagpipes as a baby face. What am I going to do with this guy? Right. He comes to me. He, this man was brilliant. Right. He says, I'm going to give you a big break. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, let me think about it. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. He said, the guy's name was Java Rook, whose real name was Johnny Rods, but when he was on the West yeah. Coast, he put uh, the days in curtains around his head as a toque and uh, yeah. wrestled as Java Rook. He says, I want you to go in there. And don't lay a glove on him. Just let him beat you up. And he walked away. And I thought to myself, oh, here we go again. Well, what was I? I couldn't beat the guy up anyway, so I got in the ring. Go with the program. Go with the program, and he just beat the dog out of me. And TV was on Wednesdays, and the house show was on Fridays. The next Wednesday TV, there was this... Big campaign for cigarettes. I, I got a man. I'm not sure if it was Camel or whatever it was. And there was a cowboy with a black eye, and it said, "I'd rather fight than switch." Leo Garibaldi the next Wednesday had a T-shirt for me that said, "I'd rather switch than fight," and he made me Java Rook's manager. Really? And from there, they put a mic in my hand. I don't know why, Steve. I I don't like parties. Uh, I'm sure we've gone through that. I just don't have a problem with the camera. I don't know why. Right. I never wanted to be one. I, I, some things I don't know. But <laughs> I, uh, I saw an opening. Then a guy named Judo Gene LaBelle. I know Gene. Yeah, I was about, I'd be maybe 17, 18-ish now. And he saw how bad I was getting beat up, and he said, come here. And he took me under his wing for a long... Yeah, I still... If any of you people don't him. know who Gene LaBelle is, I mean, he's one of the most celebrated stunt guy, tough guy, mm. judo guys, uh, yeah. bad, was sweetest guy in the oh, world. Beautiful guy. God, I he's love such him. a sweetheart. I, I met him at the Honda dealer. Well, I saw him at Cauliflower Island. I met him at the yeah. Honda dealership buying a little scooter. He's just the greatest. So he <sighs> says, kid, we got to toughen you up a little bit. Absolutely. So Come what here. do you do? I'm he took me... Uh -huh. So Friday nights, before the matches, all the... Guys that thought they were tough and wanted to try to be a wrestler, they came early. Well, he put me in the ring with them and just instructional as we went along. <laughs> this, so this guy's beating the trash out of me, and it's kind of like uh, Gene's going, you might want to block. You know? <laughs> you know? And I started, and then he started taking me down to the dojo. And, like, he trained Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris. Yeah, yeah. And she's only given away, like, 21 dock belts. He's 80 years old still, and I love him. I wrote prefaces for his book. But he showed me how to take care of myself. And at that same time, I was doing things like playing the cucaracha on the bagpipes. Right. Da -da 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 -da. And that was how I got my first break. Um, and, and before, I know you're going to get another the question, but with Leo Garibaldi, I want to show you how, what a genius he was. So we're driving to Bakersfield. Just Leo and myself. And, you know, again, like you explained, I would listen to these guys for hours till I was going to puke. Right. Uh, throw up. And I just like, but the thing was, <laughs> I wasn't getting it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? You're going to tell me that story again? And yes, and I'm going to keep telling it till I see a bell ringing. And we're going to Bakersfield, and there was a tag team called Gordman and Goliath. 
And they hated Chavo Guerrero, who was uh, the top baby face at the time. There's a big and jealousy thing. So on the way there, I said to Leo, I says, uh, so what's going to happen tonight and all this kind of stuff? And he says, I'm going to have Chavo beat uh, Gorman. One of the two. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, and he keeps talking, wrestling and stuff. And so we get to Bakersfield, and I'm sitting there, and uh, it's a little round building. And Leo Garibaldi lays out the biggest bunch of baloney, nothing that he told me, that I've ever heard. It was so bad, everything so bad, that all of a sudden, Gorman and Goliath, they're getting hot. And they're half uh, uh, Hispanic and half English talking back and forth. And now they hate Leo. This is stupid, this is <laughs> And all of a sudden, Gorman goes, I'm going to put Chavo over just to show you. That's genius. Right. That right. is genius. And he started wow. teaching me the psychology. Yeah. And then he said, the moves are just a translation for the psychology. Right. As words are right. for changing thoughts. Right. Brilliant. So the light went Thanks off. Thanks for your, letting me get but the, out. But the light went off in your head Boom. as soon as uh, Gorman yeah. Yeah. said, hey, okay, this is what we'll do. I, Just. And then I started listening. Right. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. You own or rent your home. Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. But it's funny because, you know, when you or I talk to, to some young cats every now and then, you can tell them to their to the to your blue in the face, but sometimes, and you can just see it yeah. because we've been there and done yeah. it, experienced it. It's not really going in yet because it's not ready to go in. Exactly. And at, at a certain level, it will start to be able to sink in. Some people will always be impervious to it. Some will soak it in sooner than, than others. Yeah. But that's just the way the business is. It is, and you can tell. Like I know you, if you're driving down the road, you see somebody younger, you know it almost in a beat and a half. Yeah, it's worth it, or right. wonderful guy, but right. that's what it is. Yeah, and you sometimes know? you got to go through the process just to, you know. To find out. Yeah. Or to be nice. Yeah. But so, anyway, you guys, uh, the, the light bulb goes off in, in your brain, and you're getting promo time. He gave you, Leo gave you a mic. Well, so, man, I mean, where were your promos coming from? I mean, like, because you're God. known as being one of the best promo guys of all time. It's always funny to me when, when someone wants to lay down their top five promos and, and you know most yeah. people the thing about the thing about wrestling the thing about uh, the in-ring product or, or the microphone uh is, is is really subjective by and large to the for the most part you know, subjective but among top guys that's a different story yes sir. so when i would say my top talkers you are on that list Thank there's a difference there, there's good and bad and there's people that don't know it's like i love rock and roll music some of my best friends play rock and roll guitar I can listen to the same thing they're listening to, but I don't really get it. I get it on my I, level. Yes. So we're yes, talking exactly. on a higher level. So exactly. with that being said, what was the genesis of, of the, the Hot Rod wow. or just the Roddy Piper promo in general? Holy cow. Uh, huh, good for you. See what it did good there? Good for you. I see yeah. what you did there, and you did it really good. And with respect, I, I love you. I, I'll tell you the truth. Um, at that time, I was harboring... Um, so much humiliation and uh, anger and rejection and, and, and like no pity party here. I'm mm -hmm. just answering the question, you know. Straight up. Um, and I've been beat up, uh, beat up so many times. One time to the point that I was taken to a hospital and they didn't, they couldn't figure out who I was. Um, that when I got that mic, I just let it out. Right. And it was like therapy. Yeah. And I had so much in it. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, you know, everything's my fault. But uh, I, I remember when I was 13, I, and it's kind of silly, but uh, uh, I sat on a curb in a town and I started crying. And uh, 
Oh, about two, three hours later, I figured out, no one's going to come. Right. <laughs> well, okay, I guess you better get up. Mom's not going to make you the sandwich. Right. And um, other things that had happened, and so I can say anything, you got it. Right. And then the more, as I went along, I started to change the structure of interviews because, like, the Crusher or uh, the or Billy's grandma, all great, Dusty Rhodes, they're all great, but they go like, oh, I'm going to rip your rib cage out, tear your eye out. You know, but that never happened. Right. So I learned, I started a system where if I said it, I had to try to do it. Otherwise, you lose all your credibility. Right. You're building credibility. I get you. Yeah. 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 And, you know, like one of the, and when one works for you, you get a tremendous amount of confidence. Right. So the one that really worked for me was um, I had I was sitting on a donkey painted as a zebra. Like I got the idea in Tijuana, and I had a T-shirt that said Conquistadors of the Guerreros. And are you still in L.A. at this time? I'm in L.A., okay, yeah. Go ahead. And I got the mic, and yeah. I'm like rolling. And I got a sombrero on, and I got a, a piece of tree branch with a string and a carrot. Oh, Jesus All right? Christ. And I'm rolling. <laughs> okay. Luckily, here we go. Now, that TV went all over the world in Spanish. I still remember the number. RI95171. I think it was channel 54-ish. 32, 54 Still going. Yeah. The <laughs> president of the channel got so hot. Went to my, and we're going to take them off TV. Really? Like, oh, a lot of heat. And I'm going, no, and you apologize. I'll apologize. I'm off. So, like, for, it took about two weeks of TVs, and I said, the gaita is the word in Spanish for bagpipes. I said, listen, I am so sincere. I'm so sorry. And uh, all right, uh, as I'm trying to learn the math. It's hard because it's a Scottish instrument. Do I buy? Okay, all of a sudden I say, I got it. When you come on Friday nights, I'm playing it. Okay. So, baby Jesus, man. I got up in that ring, and the announcer's name was Jimmy Lennon, who saved my yeah. life. Wow. Great man. Yeah. He saved my life from a guy shooting me. Uh, it, another story. So I got in the ring and I said to Jimmy Lennon, please tell them to be quiet and stand for the Mexican national anthem. <laughs> I smell a rat. Brother, what they happened? stood up, babies in their arms, total commitment, hand over the heart. Of course. Could have heard a pin drop. At that moment, I went to myself. I wonder, and before I knew it, <laughs> and I say, nee, and there are, da 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 Holy cow, the chairs were bolted. The chairs came up. The first successful stabby. The match never got started. Uh, but wow. Shooting heat. What a roll. S straight up heat. Yeah, too much to the white. Right, right, you know, right. Red's right. good, but the was getting right. in the white. And uh, it made the, right. made the AP in our business. And it gave me a confidence boost. Right. So now I got Gene, and I'm starting to form my own formula. And then uh, just like an incredible bunch of talented guys that were teaching me, you know. Incredible but you, you, you love being a heel. I'm a born heel. You're a born heel. I, I hate being a baby. I, I wanted to be a heel because that's what I, you know, shy kid, same, little different background, but shy kid. Yeah. And for me, just being a heel, having that freedom and, you know, you, you can't fail. You know, yeah. I mean, you, you can. You can yeah. be not, not, a, not a good heel. Yeah. But, I mean, right. you can't fail from, from the performance standpoint. It's execution. Yeah. And it was yeah. real. I Whoa. made my biggest mark as a baby face, or maybe, a, a, you know, a, a gray area baby face. But you love being a heel. I still would be one. The way, you know what happened? Is in WrestleMania 2, I can't figure it out. Now, this is a boxing match between you and Mr. Yeah, Hill, right? yeah. Do you want me? I'm like, I'll stick with you, because I'll go all over the place. Okay. No, 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 no. We're everywhere anyway. Look, we're already, look, he says, you've I, already done that. There's, there's a studio of people in here watching. This is my first time here at the Podcast One Studios in Beverly Hills. I'm back from Texas. I got all kinds of technology. I made notes for Rowdy Roddy Piper, and I knew as soon as we got in the room, 
we would just start shooting the breeze. So yeah. here's the thing. Yeah. You're, you're in L.A. all the time, so yes, you can drop in and out as much as you want I to. I would be honored. We're just, we're just doing audio <laughs> whoop-ass. We ain't got to follow anything chronological. Thank God. I do this show for the working man and the working woman, and as long as they're happy, I'm happy. I and obviously, it. you're over here laughing your ass off, so you got to be I'm having a good too. time or that shows your range as an actor. <laughs> I, I know. I, it's All right, really so, cool. This is very so cool. So I, I send you in. Uh, you duck a couple uh, elbows. I, I put you in a sleeper. Uh, and you, you reverse that, and you got me in a sleeper. So where do you want to go with this? Do you want to stay in L.A., or you want to talk, talk uh, about Piper's Pitch, or you want to talk see. about N.W.A.? What about the dog collar match with Valentine? Oh, I mean, we're all over the place. Yeah. Where do you want to go? Well, because, okay, I, think, I know you love being a heel. That's uh, where, yeah. yeah. But you're scrappy, and you had to work for every single thing. Cause I, and cause I was a little Because, man... It just, just I always try to, to want the younger generation to learn something out of the shows when I talk to people like you. Obviously, I don't talk to too many people that are in your ballpark, but you know what I'm saying. So too, this is a guy who was a heel because he, want, you know, if, you a know. lot of things that happen in your life. But it, from, a, from the performance part of wrestling, you want it to be hated. Yes. I, you know, I same here. It. I loved it. You know, and, and when you reverse it, because I always, I always thought this about you, Roddy. I always thought that as a heel, you can make every single person hate you. Not, and they weren't divided. No. I mean, you, there was a small smidgen. But those, you know, that, that's, yeah. that's just because. And when you were a baby face, you made people love you. There wasn't, you know, there, there, yeah. it, was, it was almost all or nothing with you. And that's, that's as about as good a compliment as you can give a guy who's kind. trying to be a heel or trying to be a baby that's face. kind. Uh, the, the thing was, like, but when you work the territories, the, what, you, what, what I learned was you had to come in as a heel and then turn baby face because you got a double run. Right. And what guys don't understand, and then you were finished that territory for L, in, L.A., for instance, you go to Portland, nobody knows who the hell you are. Right. I say, okay, quick, quick, Don Owen. Let's sorry. do it. Don, right, Don Owen, so, Portland wrestler. All right, so, like, I'm scared to leave L.A. because I'm on top, and, you know. And things are trying, good. Things are good, and Rod White, yeah, because if you really want to do this. One thing that I watched all the time was my progression and my age. I was ready to take a left-hand turn if things weren't going good. And you were still very, very young. Yeah. In the wrestling little, business. Little I mean, geez. Too young. Yeah. A little too young. Uh, geez, what was I going to tell you? No, you were going to Portland wrestling. It's a dino yeah, 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 story. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so anyway, finally I get the guts to go. And it's it's live, live TV uh, oh. with Don Owens. Now, Don Owens, if you don't know him, he was a wonderful man. And, like, uh, Thanksgiving, he would bring turkeys for the boys. And one year they had the midgets, so, like, he bought them Cornish hens. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, great. Yeah, yeah. He's that kind of yeah, yeah. ranch, and he's a good old guy. So it's my first day in the territory, and, you know, he's heard whatever, so all right. He's announcing, and I'm in the ring, and I tell him, what, like, shut up for the Scottish National Anthem, whatever. <laughs> Boom, blow up the bagpipes. And I used to play him like Jack Benny. Just total actual torture to boo me. Yeah. <laughs> They start booing. Thank you, baby. All of a sudden, Don Owens stop, stop. He stops me. He looks at the crowd. Stop, stop. He says, "Now, I can't play the bagpipes, and neither can you. Let's give him another chance." <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Just take the bagpipes, yeah. and I'll move on. Yeah. And now, so you know, I always ran into. I just was a story. Uh yeah, and then, so in, in Portland, uh, what I had learned from L.A., I started to be able to apply with no, no restrictions, and here nobody knew what I was doing. That was really important, to keep that to yourself. In the code, uh, what you're doing, you keep to yourself. Uh, you never, never open up. And so what I learned from L.A., I used in Portland... What I learned from L.A. and Portland, the next shot was Charlotte, right. and we get to uh, Charlotte Land and, and, uh, NWA. Car and uh, Crockett. NWA, Crockett, wall, out of control by this time, too. The business had been swelling. Okay, out of control. Yeah. You talking about on the party oh, end, or are you talking about? I'm talking about, you know, 
or you just even pa- call it partying. It was a it was a lifestyle lifestyle uh, caught up in the highs of being in the business and yeah, successful. The confidence yeah. you, you guys are flying. You could do anything yeah. you wanted to do. It was bulletproof. Bulletproof. Right. Fastest gun, uh, slamming cars, and you know just uh, bad, bad, and but, wild. Bad, bad, but but you know, had a blast. I dare, but I know, but but I mean, dare I say, acceptable back then. These were, yes. you know, this this is what that you know era was. One of the ways, because we didn't have the media, that we would get attention. Right. For instance, Jay York would we come out of a small town, and Jay York with a twelve foot bull whip around him and uh, uh, a buck knife, six five, three hundred pounds, go to a restaurant and say, "Give me a dozen eggs and a pound of bacon." And then Gorgeous George would be down in the beauty parlor with the window getting his hair done. And so that's the way. And then Piper just got arrested. Right. All right, good. We got a car. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and that's the way it was. Right. Um, but, like, th- people start, we started losing people. Right. We're losing them fast for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, and so I come to the dog collar match. We just... You know, I'm trying to get there. <laughs> no, but 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 you know, in in listening and, and reading about you, you you spoke to there was a period and you went to a real black hole. I may I guess maybe it might have been the, the, one of your really low points. And yeah, uh, yeah. we the business had been losing a lot of guys. Yeah. What was that the wake up call for you uh, to to, to peel back a little bit in moderation, or you just, you just you just hit a bad spot and you stayed there for a while? I, I tell you, I tell you. I'm being honest. I'll tell you what happened to me where I got kicked into I don't care whether I live or die. Right. Is, um, so I, I'll take us back to L.A. for a second. Um, Vince McMahon Sr. and Mike LaBelle, the promoter here in L.A., you know, all promoters, every Monday they would talk, and mm-hmm. I had this house, and I who did you have on top, etc. And so he's Mike LaBelle's bragging about me, and... Uh, he has Vince Junior, uh, Vince Senior, rather come bring me in, and uh, I don't know, maybe I was nineteen, twenty, whatever that is. Holy cow! So I come into Madison Square Garden. I come in in a car, and uh, they pick me up, and uh, like there's some just kind of new young wrestlers like Andre the Giant, Tony Atlas, uh, Bobby Backlund, Bruno Sammartino, and just a couple of Hall of Famers, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, future Hall of Famers, yeah, little guys. And I'm probably, again, about a buck 80. <laughs> and the bagpipes is a woodwind instrument. You have to play it a little bit before you go out. When I first came into the garden, Captain Lil Bono comes to me, and he squeezed my chair, Paisan, and he gives me a hug. It's rest of love. We don't watch you here. We've been watching you on that Spanish team. Right. Ah, get out of here. You didn't know that was a shoot at the time. <laughs> I thought it was rest of love. Right. And Freddie Blassie, classy Freddie Blassie, had a cane and come over and slam me in my shins. I know not to react by now. Yeah. Hey, you kid, pencil neck geek, da 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 da, we don't want you. <laughs> nice guys. Right. Man, so, man. yeah, warmed up the bagpipes and I put them aside. Mm-hmm. And the truth is, I was doing push ups trying to look like 181 pounds. Yep. Or whatever. Get your little pump. Just anything, anything going my way. I come out there and, of course, Tell them all to shut up for the Scottish National Anthem. Well, Madison Square Garden is just 24,000 Puerto Ricans with knives. Right. <laughs> it yep. takes them a while. and But, like, I knew. I, I was confident. And right. Promoters came from Japan, Germany, and the mans are out there to look at this boy wonder. A hell and, of a damn opportunity to. Oh, okay. on top of 19 in the most yeah. prestigious venue in a while. Right. And as we know, boom, I went to play the bagpipes and nothing came up. Mm-mm. And again, I came fifth in the world. Mm-hmm. I'm changing the spark plugs on the fly, the oil, what's going on. Right. A lot. I'm Now I'm scrambling, yeah. drop them, go after the guy, do the finish, come back to the locker room, literally. Don't call us, we'll call you. Left in a cab. Right. Back to the airport. And, you know, like I totally fell on my face. And everybody was happy about it because I had, I had been on top so young that, you know, they wanted you to fail back then. So it was a little brutal from that perspective. But, but- finally I went, what, what happened? And I grabbed the bagpipes in the cab. Like I was really, I was like a... 
a deer in, I don't know what I'm saying, the headlights. So you didn't know that you had been screwed no. yet. You're about to find that out upon examination. Yeah. The I bagpipe, just, go ahead. Because, so, like, all of a sudden the match is over. I'm back. Get out. Yeah, you, you, you failed. I failed. Yeah. Get out. And like, You don't know why you failed. Not a clue. So what happened? And I, I, I like, I barely showered. I put, literally, get out. Yeah. And there's a cab, and I, I go back. And I'm, you know, I'm, ma, I'm pretty crestfallen at this point. And then what the heck? And bagpipes. And when they said they didn't want me, they meant it. And crestfallen turned to straight up rage and anger. R- ra- humiliation. They sabotage your bagpipes. Freddie Blassie put six feet of toilet paper where your fingers are. It's called a chanter. Put six feet of toilet paper up there so they wouldn't work. It's like if you were Elvis Presley. And coming to get any, you cut his mic off. Right. Right. Holy cow. And, um, you know, I was, I didn't have anybody. I was by myself. I didn't have any family. And uh, I got really mean and didn't, really didn't care if I lived or died. Every day. And almost push it because I... I, ra- I almost wanted to be put out of my misery. So when I got into bad situations, I, it looked like courage, but it was coward because I would just pull right into it. Um, it was a hard shot, that was. A that is a, a very hard shot. But, but along with that, on top of the way you come up through your youth, getting on the road at such a young age, uh, learning the business like you did, and then all of a sudden you're gaining confidence, momentum, steam, the big opportunity. Oh, they, they flat out tell you, you they don't want you there. Then no. they prove it. And you don't know what's yeah. going on, and all of a sudden then there's the screw job, and that's when everything turns to rage and anger. And it almost seems like I, always, I created a thing, uh, Roddy, back in the day. I told uh, Brian Pillman after I attacked him in the ring, and I told him, DTA, brother, don't don't trust anybody. Yeah. It sounds like you were living DTA 24-7 yeah. because it I was you against trust. the world. I still have trust issues. Yeah, yeah. Still, and I, I can't open up about the business. I, you know what? It, here's some, Mick Foley said something. Let's just kind of stay here for a second. It might be interesting to, to your fans. Um, as, as you know, we won't say about I don't, someday we'll talk about how professional wrestling got started. In the, in, oh, yeah, America. another day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But... but like what you got to understand this gorgeous George and all those boys and people coming in cats and ties and minks. Okay. And all of a sudden, I don't know, 59, 60, 61, there's business is corrupt falls on its face, but there was all these guys like 35 that were going to be the next main event. They're over to getting another job. They got families and boom. What? And so they all form territories. And now I come. Ah, are you kidding me? You know, this this kid, I've got, that was their attitude. They didn't, right. they didn't want it. And uh, they were very happy I failed. So after taking that in, I went a long time, meaning I went through from L.A. to Portland to Charlotte, where a guy with a knife, I just came at him. He stabbed me, and I didn't care. I honestly didn't care. To Atlanta, where things got really out of control. And you know who first wanted to take over the world? Was Jim Barnett. Right. And he had me sign a contract with Ole Anderson. Had one of the very first contracts. And But his friend was a Chicago Tribune guy, and he didn't want to bust borders. And after they signed me the contract... Uh, they fired me and blackballed me in, over the entire world. And I had my, my at that time, my first child, and uh, they set me up. Uh, I was with Tommy Rich. I had a double shot. Tommy Rich accidentally, whatever, went 100 miles the wrong way and had to turn around for Chattanooga. And there was cops posted. Anyway, you know, made the double shot late, and then they fired me, and they turned me into the IRS, and they blackballed me around the world. And that's where... Uh, I love Ric Flair so much because at that time, like I could only go to like Japan, sing, uh, um, what is that, uh, uh, Santo Domingo, you know, Puerto Rico, Rico. Yeah. yeah. And I got a, I got a child, man. Um, 
So, and you know, when I got <laughs> when I got blackballed and all this happened, my wife and I, let's say, go to a movie, and it was just the first showing of Rambo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I come out of that movie with machine guns, <laughs> grenade launchers. You was ready to get I back was, on a mission. You betcha. I, and, uh, you know, I then somehow got back with Crockett and, you know, then the whole Starcade thing took place. Um, I, I guess whew, my point is this. So when the gorgeous era, and you got all these mean guys, right? right. Let me put this all together now. It makes sense. <sighs> Mick Foley, which I, I love Mick. He's a really great guy. I've seen him. He's so what did he say? You, you, you he said, said this. He said this. He says, uh, you know, uh, I've been mankind, uh, dude love, whatever. And he says, then there's, you know, like kind of like you, Roddy, where you lived it 24-7. You know, I found that really interesting and respectful because here's the truth. To regain the, the respect for the industry, you had to be the guy 24-7. If you went into a bar and someone said fake, I was all over you. Because, and Flair, they want, because people were so... And these guys, even you know, with Hogan, he's Hogan 24-7 Flair. I could get with my family later, but you had to be that guy. From about 73-ish to now we're coming up to 80. And then the fans, there was a whole swelling of professional wrestling is getting cool again. And out of TBS, and then, then, they, then they fired my fired me. But it's a really great observation on Mick Foley's part. But the amount of sacrifice, not only those three men I just mentioned, but many others like them that made for our sport business, uh, they gave their lives to it. And that's where I get mad, where they take care of your own is like, and I, you know, I love Vince today. He's, yeah. he's sick, twisted, I love him. Uh, and, uh, but what they don't know what we did for their business. And, and the last point I'll make that on this is, WrestleMania one after it was finished, T. Hogan and McMahon were at this big party. Bobby Orton and I, everybody was gone. Our car was gone. There was nothing, no security. We walked down that round thing to the bottom, and there's a policeman on a horse. And we realized, like, serious? And we just busted out that door. I don't know how many people. Just hitting and swinging, got right. a cab, drove away. When you get treated like that, sometimes day after day, and you're constantly fighting, and then the people would come after my family. You know I knocked Mr. T down, kicked Cindy Lopper, slapped whatever, whatever. I got people coming after my family. Right. Um, it was a full-time job, and um, you had to live it. So, And the way I kind of got out of it was when my first child was born. I want, you know, uh, this is corny, man. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I watched an episode of the Waltons, and it was a Christmas Waltons, and they had the family around, and yeah, I'm eating the turkey and stuff, and, and I, I wanted to have that family. And then all of a sudden, the lady I was with got pregnant, and there's an old saying, you need a license to hunt, you need a license to fish, any idiot can have a kid, takes a man to be a father. And it wasn't overnight, but I uh, I wanted to be a good dad, and uh, and I got really dark there. That was very, you know, that would have been uh, oh, the entire eighties. I was really hard to deal with. Okay, whoa, 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 Roddy, let's put the brakes on right now. I'm getting a high sign from Stacy in there in the other side of that window. So we're going to put it to a close here. We're going to come back next week, continue down this same path. Incredible stories from one of the biggest legends in the history of pro wrestling, one of the guys that I have the utmost respect for. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Support for this podcast comes from Pluto TV. Ready to get away from it all? Free yourself with Pluto TV. 
Stream hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and shows all for free. Yeah, free. No contracts, no subscriptions, no fees. Imagine 24-7 channels of Narcos, CSI, Star Trek, Survivor, and everything else from hit movies to binge-worthy TV shows, the latest news, live sports, comedy, and more. What are you waiting for? Download the free Pluto TV app for Android or iPhone and start watching now. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free.